All right, everybody, y'all are going to participate in my uh, five adult needed speech for the online class. Can somebody come over and look in the, in the video and make sure I'm on video? Mm -hmm. Is that it? Anybody? Can <laughs> you get for you? Yes, you're good. My head's not chopped off? Nope. Okay, I had to redo one the other day because somebody said, did you know your head was chopped off the whole time? <laughs> sure did. Not really. All right, I'm going to talk about, uh, this is not part of the speech, I'm just letting you guys and gals know, I'm going to talk about healthcare because I was in the healthcare industry for a really long time, so it's, uh, it's close to my heart or something like that, yeah. All right. <clears throat> hey, you need to settle down. That's enough. Settle down. All right. I'm the girl. All right. Got to make sure I got some good eye contact. Yeah, you're all on your phones. That's, that's fine. All right. <clears throat> For 13 years, I worked as an emergency paramedic here in town. And I could talk about all the scenes and all the terrible gore and the different violence and all the some of the more crazier things that you wouldn't even think are crazy, like people who are taking something that's messed them up mentally and turns out to be a terrible, difficult situation. But I'm not going to talk about any of that stuff because I want to talk about the healthcare system as a whole. So I do have a story. Uh, none of those things are included in it. So I get called out to a residence and this elderly lady lives alone at home. She doesn't want any help. Typical situation. And she's falling in, in her bathtub. Not her bathroom. In her bathtub and she was taking a shower or something like that. So there was a lot of water, and as you can imagine, uh, some immodesty involved as well. So uh, we get her, we take care of her immediate needs, you know, it's two guys and here's this lady. So we take care of her immediate needs, and she, she's hurt. She's not doing good, she's bumped her head, she's got a bruise on it, and we get her out, she just wants to be taken care of, you know, she wants to be uh, clothed and so on. And so she says, all right, I'm good. Thanks for helping me out of the bathtub. Uh, Y'all have a good day. Bye. And we said, well, hang on now. You've got this big bump on your head. You are this other factors that make you high risk for potential problems. You had a really hard fall in a bathtub, which is also not good. And she just said, no, no, I'm going to be all right. If anything gets worse, I'll call a family member. Well, this kind of get worse means you really can't call your family member. You wouldn't know how. Uh, so we convinced her, but her biggest issue was the cost of an emergency room visit. Even if you feel like you should go, the insurance is such that they may not pay. They may not pay for the whole visit. They may not pay for any of the visit. And they go and show up and nothing's wrong, then they don't really want to pay because they don't consider it an emergency. So she also was concerned about how she was going to get home. This was late at night, probably <laughs> between 10 and midnight. And she was concerned about how she was going to get home because we all know that once you go to the ER, you're there for a while. And we did convince her to go. We don't convince everybody to go, but it is our job to try to convince them to go because we don't have any x-rays, we don't have any MRIs, we can't do blood work in somebody's house. Not yet. Maybe one day that can, that can happen. So she did go. And, you know, there's these rules and regulations around it, but I did find out later that she did actually have a brain bleed. Now, luckily, it turned out to be a good story. She went right away, they seen it right away, they watched it, they gave her some medicine to keep her blood pressure down, and last I heard she was fine. She was fine and at home. So I want to talk about some of those, some of those issues around that kind of thing. Um, throughout all those years of being a paramedic, it, a lot of times I was bogged down in the daily work of it, and I would get sent to a scene and that's what I was dealing with whatever it came along with it. So I didn't want to, somebody didn't want to have the bill to come back later, so they would, I mean, you would have a knife sticking out of their arm and wouldn't want to go to the hospital. They just want you to take the knife out. She can't do that. So, um, <clears throat> but it shaped me going through all those different issues. And I want to talk about the American healthcare system, uh, the industry around it, um, some of the issues um, with uh, the rising cost of healthcare, and also the fact that our emergency services and our doctor's offices are now, because of trying to cover costs, are just jam-packed and overloaded. And I'm sure we've all experienced some of that. Um, everyone needs access to healthcare at some point. 
so so we're all going to need access to healthcare, and we can argue that the uh, we can argue what should change, but I don't think we can argue that there needs to be a change. And in the uh, in a Forbes article, uh, and I'm going to quote uh, the U.S. Commerce Department Bureau of Economic Analysis recently announced in 2014. So uh, announced that healthcare spending costs rose. 9.9% in the first quarter of 2014, which was the largest quarterly increase in more than 30 years. And that was just in that quarter, 9.9%, call it 10% rise in healthcare costs across the nation. This is just the United States. And it's risen even more since then. There's a bunch of numbers and a bunch of facts on that article, but I'm not going to go through all of it and bore you with it. Um, so we all need access to, to the healthcare system. So now I want to talk about this doctor. Uh, Dr. Peter Adia is how I'm going to say it. He was a surgeon. He went and he, he helped people in the emergency room when there was a surgical consult needed. So he would go in there and he would do a surgical consult and then he would do the next consult, the next consult, the next consult because these ERs are so busy. And he came up to one patient who he, who he prejudged because of obesity. And he prejudged because, you know, if, you should just take care of yourself, right? That, that's, he's prejudging that. And uh, a large portion of people with diabetes are actually thin. It's not just people who are overweight, and as he said, fat. So in his TED Talk in 2013, he, it's entitled, it is, the, is the obesity crisis hiding a bigger problem? So he was coming at it from diabetes and obesity and insulin uh, issues, but this speaks to the issues with getting care in America. Uh, he said, step one is accepting the possibility that our current beliefs about obesity, diabetes, and insulin resistance could be wrong. Uh, and he expressed remorse for the way he did treat that patient. That was just one example he was giving. He was overworked. He was under-arrested. Uh, under-arrested. He, uh, he didn't have enough rest. And, and so he... He made that decision. He blamed it on himself for the way he treated that that lady. And he wishes he could have went back and um, and helped her, but he but he really couldn't. Um, on the Center for Disease Control, the CDC website, it talks about the average wait times are about 30 minutes to be seen in the ER, and then another hour to get whatever you have taken care of if it's a non-emergency issue. <laughs> now, I can speak from personal experience that. Those numbers are very, very, very generous because I don't know if any of you in here have been to the emergency room. You might have had a car wreck with the emergency room. You might have had a car wreck with the emergency room only because you had the car wreck and they want to check you out just in case type of scenario. In other words, you weren't begging to go to the emergency room. It just worked out that way. And what happens is, is because of our healthcare system, in such a way where people can't afford to go to the doctor's office, people can't afford their medications, and they keep ending up back in the emergency room for, for like urgent care because now they haven't had their medications. And so now people are trying to go to the emergency room for emergencies, like from a car wreck as an example, and their wait times are really, really, really increased. I can speak to six hour wait times before you ever get to see a doctor here in our emergency rooms. It, it happens very, very, very regular. Now, I, I quit the uh, emergency services about a year ago, but I have a lot of friends who work there, and I, and I know it's, it's still the same. Um, so what? I mean, what are, we, uh, what are we supposed to do about healthcare? How can we possibly make a difference? We all know, I think, that people who are in charge in healthcare, and I'm not picking on any one particular group of insurance companies or shareholders or doctor clinics or whatever, they're making money. And they're making profits. Uh, there are some facilities and hospitals that are considered not for profit. So at the end of the year, they have to roll all the monies that are profits back into the company, like salaries and things like that, so that it's not profits. Um, but I think if we only concentrate on that issue, the issue that these fat cats are making all this money, I think we're thinking about the wrong way because I would assume most of us are not those people. Um, so there's some actions we can do on our own. We can participate in preventative health care. It's out there. It, there's a scare that it's going to cost money, and, and so people don't do it. 
People don't do preventative health care. They don't do it for themselves, and a lot of times they don't even do it for their friends. Um, making ourselves aware of healthy eating habits. You know, y'all are in school. I'm in school right now. I'm also working. A lot of y'all are, I'm sure, working. Healthy eating habits are not easy. You can't just go over to the healthy eating habit store and say, I want that healthy eating habit on the menu. That's just not the way it works. We go and we get a chicken sandwich. But we need to be more, uh, more aware of that. Uh, and then, yes, we can talk to the people who are in charge. We can voice to these people. There are um, uh, uh, committees that are working on writing these different amendments and writing bills and stuff. Our voices can be heard. All their offices have phone numbers. You can find them really, really easy. I, I, not every day I do call those phone numbers though, and you just leave a message and then you hope that maybe somebody listens to it, but it's still something. And you can see I'm not exactly confident in the system because it's going to take a lot, but, but I do think it is some, we do have some uh, responsibility. Uh, I don't really want to get bogged down in this message about whose re health care reform <coughs> plans are best and whether or not the, some of the more recent things we've done, like the Affordable Care Act, was the best thing to do. Like, that's not the argument I want y'all to think about. That's not the argument I want to have here. The argument I want to have, or the discussion I want to have is, do we even need reform? Is what is happening now fine? And is it working for most people? And I don't think that it is. So where do we go from here? Um, do we give up on health care? You know, because some people say that healthcare is not a human right. It's emergency services, like you're about to die, we need to save you, that's a human right. But anything on top of that is not a human right. That's a, that is a major argument in some uh, uh, people involved in it, especially in doctors, because the doctors want to get paid. And if we pass some of these reforms, they're not going to. And I have a close friend who's a doctor, so I'm not picking on any one group here. Um, I guess we could just throw up our hands and say, you know what, I'm in the emergency room, I'm going to get care, this is the best that they can do, yeah, I've got to wait for a while, maybe my condition's getting worse, but we've got a big population, this is the hospital. I don't think that's the right thinking either. Uh, like I described earlier, there are issues there involved, like people need to take their chronic medication but can't because of cost issues. Um, I think we should... I think we should accept these issues. I think we should call them issues. I think that, um, and the issues I'm not saying problem, because if everything's a problem, we just, we just say, fine, it's a problem, nothing I can do about it. But they're just issues, and I think we can all help on those issues. Um, and I think that it's important, and I hope that y'all all agree. Thank you. Proof of the teacher y'all were here.